Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Hello and thank you for joining us today. You are listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. My name is Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar and I look forward to spending the next 14 minutes with you as we study today's lesson, which is titled Tainted Temple Leadership. If you were listening yesterday, we remarked how the lessons this week, uh, they're sad to look at historically to see how God's people uh, once again failed to reach the um, level of experience that he wanted for them. But we also uh, gave a warning that these lessons may be uncomfortable for us today because, uh, as we always seek to do, when we apply the lessons uh, for us, we realize, you know, we may also be making some of the same mistakes that God's people did back then. Of course, God's promises remain, and uh, we are thankful for His power and His ability to bring us back where He wants us to be. Uh, Before we go any further, just want to remind you, if you are new to our podcast, that you can go online to pathwaytoparadise.org. You can uh, follow the links for Deeper from the homepage there. Uh, Of course, you can listen to today's episode as well as any previous episode this year. And also look for the weekly study guide and teacher help, which can be downloaded or read online. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we open your word today for the next few minutes, we pray as we always do that you would send your Holy Spirit Lord, we realize what you say in your Bible is true, that um, spiritual things cannot be understood without the uh, help and assistance of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask for this guidance and discernment and wisdom today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, David, we're looking at uh, this week. Uh, this week's set of lessons really goes through a number of ways in which the Jews um backslid after Nehemiah returns back to the service of the king. We don't know exactly how long he was gone, uh, certainly months. It could have been several years. But when he comes back again, um, he is deeply saddened and probably shocked to find a number of ways in which the people have fallen from everything that he had worked so hard uh, to help establish and set up there. And uh, today we're looking at the leadership because so many of these problems stemmed from the failure of the leadership there in Jerusalem. I'm going to start reading from Nehemiah chapter 13 and verses 4 and 5. And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah, and he had prepared for him a great chamber who aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. Kind of a long verse there in verse number five. Uh, But David, let's start by identifying who these two people are. Uh, Eliashib was the uh, high priest, correct? Correct. Uh, yeah, he was chosen as high priest in Nehemiah 3.1. We actually see that. But then we have this other man, Tobiah. And Tobiah was someone that had been an enemy of Nehemiah, who had been one of those that had really tried to stop the work of the rebuilding of the wall. And uh, it's just kind of, as you mentioned, fascinating to see that this man who is a open enemy of God, of, of the purpose of Nehemiah and God, what, was do- what, what God was doing through Nehemiah for the children of Israel, for the city of Jerusalem, how the high priest made an allegiance with him. Uh, maybe some people may say he was trying to be merciful and show love to this you know, person and, and, and then the pretense of loving your enemies. Maybe, I don't know what the purpose was, but ultimately though, this is a type of allegiances or alliances that you cannot make. You cannot make uh, compromise, you know, with uh, especially in the in the role of leadership, with someone that has been, uh, you know, a complete rebel against God's indications and and His purpose. So mm-hmm. this is a very important aspect that we should analyze with us today as well. You know, are we thinking that way? You know, is is it okay to to side with or have uh, a relationship with those that are opposed to the truth and to the standards of God? And it's good for us to remember to what level Tobiah 
had opposed Israel. He was actually involved in plots in earlier years to uh, murder or assassinate Nehemiah. He had tried everything possible along with um, others that he conspired with to stop the building of the wall, uh, to uh, cut off the flow of money, anything they could think of to frustrate God's purpose in Jerusalem being rebuilt. So this is not just, uh, what, a, someone out in a little village that's throwing sticks and stones and yelling things. He He's conspiring against God and his people here. Um, the lesson brings out the fact that uh, many scholars believe the, the uh, alliance between Eliashib, the high priest, and Tobiah, this enemy of God and his people, was through marriage. And that's not explicitly stated in, in the Bible, but uh, many scholars believe that that's probably the case. At any rate, there is a relationship here that appears to be uh, quite close. And where does Tobiah end up living there in Jerusalem? Well, in the temple, pretty much, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's and it's not just any room in the temple. It's the room where many of the treasures are stored, uh, frankincense, the offerings, the tithes. Uh, you almost get the impression that he ends up, I don't know if you can say in control of the money, but uh, he's right here beside the finances uh, of the temple as well, which is a very fascinating and sad development. Yeah, it's mentioned the Bible is a great chamber. I mean, he made... He gave him a, probably a pretty great place within the temple, you know. And and I think, Tim, that it is important to analyze, you know, that maybe there are some, humanly speaking, there were some, maybe some thinking that, uh, you know, the high priest was trying to do uh, to improve finances of the temple. Maybe he saw it was a convenience factor. Maybe they, I just mentioned the families. People are thinking that was the allegiance uh, that they had. We don't know, you know, whether their children get married, whatever it might be. But perhaps in in, in a human aspect, there were there were reasons why it made why it made sense to him, you know, to have mm-hmm. him close and to put him right there. He may have thought of the same, you know, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Maybe that applied to him. But you know, when we come to, you know, when the purp- when the aspect of God, God's people, and His church and His um, you, you know, his aspect of leading us uh, away from sin and, and into a life of uh, victory of a higher standard. We can't compromise by friendships, even though, even those that may seem good to a certain degree, if, if people are contrary to God's purpose, God's, uh, you know, standard, there has been an open rebellion in the hearts of, of or in the life of some of these people. You can't really make that type of you know, allegiance you just really is not conducive for the ministry or for the work of God. That's right. And later this week, and especially next week, we're going to be looking at another one of the challenges uh, the Jews were facing, and that is the intermarriages with, you know, those that didn't believe in God. Uh, but we see at, at the root, the same principle is um, wrecking havoc here. There is a relationship with somebody a very close relationship with somebody that uh, really doesn't care about God. Now, let's just summarize the picture here. Here we have an enemy of Nehemiah, uh, an enemy of of God, of the Israelites, and he ends up probably not living full-time, but he has a place in the temple that is his, and he uh, presumably can stop by anytime he wants and operate out of the temple. There's a fascinating parallel between this and a very, probably to many of our listeners, well-known prophetic passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to turn there right now. In this passage, Paul is um, talking about things that must happen within Christianity before the second coming of Christ. You know, Many of the early Christians believed that Jesus could come back any time and, and believed that he would. And Paul is basically saying, hold on, there's some things that need to happen first. And until you see these things happen, uh, you know, Jesus isn't going to come back before this happens. So, David, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, if you don't mind reading verses 3 and 4 for us. Absolutely. I read, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, 
or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now we understand this to be pointing especially to the time period of the Middle Ages when um, the little horn ruled not only over Christianity, but of course it was at least appeared to be part of Christianity as well, this Antichrist power uh, sitting within the temple of God and uh, wrecking all kinds of havoc spiritually uh, on on biblical Christianity. Uh, we're going to leave that history aside, and I, I want to focus on some of the results of this blending, because that's really what it is, a blending of truth and error, this, this compromise that happened mm-hmm. within Christianity. David, let's jump ahead to the same chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and um, let's go to verse 10 through 12. Right, and it says, And with all deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. I'm sorry, this is verse 10, <clears throat> verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but he pleasured in unrighteousness. You could have kept reading at 10. That's okay. <laughs> that whole passage is great because it explains some of the results of this compromise when an enemy of God is sitting inside the temple. Now, you just read verse 12. Um, having pleasure in unrighteousness. This is one of the results when uh, leadership becomes tainted and when this compromise takes place, uh, that standard of holiness and righteousness is lowered, right? And uh, it leads people to become comfortable in unrighteousness. If we go back to verse 11, uh, it says, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Uh, We can end up believing all kinds of nonsense and foolishness um, when we uh, cease to have the Bible as the foundation of our faith, when we start mixing in, uh, what can we say, cultural uh, standards. Anything else that would take our faith off of what the Bible says, all kinds of craziness can come in. And then verse 10, there's a a few more things that take place. Um, We refuse or receive not the love of the truth. And uh, of course, that is where, what, we stop uh, spending that time in God's word, appreciating, understanding that this is God's message to me personally. So a whole list of things that, that happened within Christianity historically I would dare say it was happening in Jerusalem in Nehemiah's time. And if we see the same things happening today, David, uh, it would seem to indicate that we have the same problems at the core, that there is compromise taking place. And, you know, the sad part is that a lot of times the condition or the issues develop with leadership. And, uh, you know, it's not to point fingers at the leadership as the only cause of of issues within the people of God, but it's truly a problem that must be addressed as well. You know, we have to pray that God will help our leaders to realize if there is any of these allegiances. You know, we have to apply this to our life today and to our church today. You know, is there any type of uh, mixing of of truth and error going on in our own church, because we can point out right now, you know, to the, the little home power and to the other apostate churches. And they already, we see the results of that, you know, apostasy, but when mm-hmm. it happens in God's people, it's, it's really what we have to be concerned about. And we have to say, Lord, help us not to fall into the same condition as they were in the back, back in the days. You know, we have to ask God to help us first individually and then our leaders to turn themselves and cut away those connections or those allegiances to those that are not in submission to the Lord. And again, we've been given these stories uh, that we're looking at in the Bible to help us understand what's happening today. The Bible, of course, is written for them, but it's also written for us. And we uh, can thank God that he's given us these pictures so that we can understand. We're out of time. Thanks for joining us. Please join us again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.